this will be the ninth presentation in a series entitled Understanding God's Righteousness. We've been pursuing the correct balancing of the divine principles of truth and love, in addition to correctly balancing the three great love commandments of God and Christ. Our premise is that any correct understandings about the terms of our greatest righteousness will be able to be demonstrated a number of different ways through both witnesses our Creator offers, the written Word of God being the Bible and the spoken Word of God being the terms of creation, <coughs> our natural order. We identified how God appointed two of the six altar offerings under the laws of the first kingdom of God to identify these two principles of truth and love, with the burnt offering being identified directly by God with truth, and the peace offering with love. Additionally, how those three love commandments perfectly parallel the three divisions of the peace offering, the love offering, requiring the same descending intensity as the three love commandments. We determined that truth is greater than love in our Creator's estimation, but that both are required for any degree of divine approval. Truth without love is unacceptable to God, and love without truth is utterly valueless in the pursuit of any degree of divine acceptability. The prompt for these considerations about correctly understanding God's righteousness is the prophesied state of the enlightened community immediately before the restoration of the kingdom of God. We have very little time left before our judgment. As God encouraged Joshua just before he led the enlightened community across the Jordan to inherit the promised land, where God tells him to uh, only be strong and very courageous, that you may observe to do according to all the law which Moses my servant commanded you. Turn not from it to the right hand or to the left, that you may prosper whithersoever you go. This book of the law shall not depart out of your mouth, but you shall meditate therein day and night, that you may observe to do according to all that is written therein. For then thou shalt make thy way prosperous, and then you shall have good success. We too need to be strong and of good courage, as we too are at the point of just waiting for the call to inherit the kingdom. God tells Joshua the path is to observe and perform all, not part, but all the law he passed through Moses. God instructs Joshua and ourselves not to turn aside to the left or to the right. There's a variableness, and everything had to be performed to do according to all that is written in the law, and to meditate in that law day and night and to have that law ready in our mouths. Uh, this advice God gives to Joshua just before inheriting the Promised Land is very different advice compared to what we are commonly hearing from within our enlightened community in these last days, before we, hopefully, inherit the kingdom. We are being told repeatedly that the principle of truth is overstated, that we certainly can turn aside to the left or the right, and respecting diverse understandings is actually the path to divine approval on the basis of love. We are being told that <clears throat> faithful behavior of God's standards is not really all that important, and that forgiveness is automatic and unconditional, and there's no possible contradictions to God's behavioral holiness standards that could ever distance us from Christ's approval, and that unity among people is far more significant than harmony with God. There's a good reason why we, specifically our current generation, we need to hear God's encouragement to Joshua to be strong and of good courage, to do all of God's requirements and not to turn aside, even to the right or to the left. More is expected from our last generation of the ecclesial age because more has been given to us. We're expected to be the most spiritually mature stage of the ecclesial bride of the Son of God, just before the wedding, which 
is the promised second immortalization event, which is scheduled for about 2,000 years from the first, as we've reviewed. But the prophecies, and there are several, identifying our exact generation of the enlightened community are quite uncomplimentary as a whole. Jesus himself defines us as the seventh ecclesial stage, the Laodicean period immediately preceding the restoration of the kingdom that's prophesied in detail beginning immediately after the Laodicean letter. And we know those letters qualify as prophecies as that is exactly what Jesus declared in the very first verse of Revelation, saying it is the revelation of Jesus Christ which God gave to him to show unto his servants things which must shortly come to pass. And again in verse 3, where we read the potential blessing for correctly understanding and applying these prophecies, we read, Blessed is he that reads, and they that hear the words of this prophecy, and keep those things which are written therein. So there's no question that the letters to the Ecclesiastes have to be understood as prophecies, and it would be, it would be pretty hard to distort the application of that last letter to our exact generation, which is just before the kingdom is restored, just as that Laodicean letter immediately precedes the detailed prophecy of the introduction of the millennial kingdom in chapters 4 and 5. The picture that Jesus presents about our generation is one of an unjustified self-satisfaction, unpalatably lukewarm, neither hot nor cold, as Jesus describes this generation of the enlightened community. Now, the personally and individually comforting issue in this consideration is that God always reserves a remnant. These unpleasant prophecies, repeated unpleasant prophecies, about our exact enlightened community generation are not universal. Thankfully, Elijah went to Sinai to condemn Israel, as Paul tells us in Romans. But God informed him that there were still 7,000 that had not bowed the knee to Baal or kissed him. There's a remnant within the enlightened community today, and it's our individual goal to be part of that smaller, divinely approved remnant. Our point of reference for any confidence in a divine approval cannot be based on how we are viewed by other people in the enlightened community. That's a dangerous but often seductive point of reference in presuming our level of acceptability to God and Christ. This remnant policy of God's will be evident with the Jewish people as well. When the Gogian gang of six confederated nations will be butchering the Jewish people at Jerusalem, at that point, uh, Christ and the saints will save a remnant, a third of them, and they will recognize their Messiah, and there will be a national repentance greater than any other previously, as described in Zechariah. A remnant will be saved. So even though quite a number of Bible prophecies define our exact generation of the enlightened community to Laodicea, and the enlightened community destroyed in the flood, and those hundreds of enlightened of the enlightened incinerated in Sodom, we can qualify as that remnant if we will personally be strong and have a good courage not turning aside to the left or the right and being careful to perform all the commandments of God and Christ that are required of us in this ecclesial age dispensation, this temporary stage in the Creator's progressive plan. Now, as we always maintain, when something is true, that truth can be validated in many different ways. So why don't we briefly look at one of those more subtle prophecies that isn't quite so obvious, but nonetheless quite bracing in its application to this exact time in the unfolding of our Creator's plan. And this will be an exercise in validating the significance and the somewhat desperate necessity for this current consideration 
of promoting the current correct understandings about the terms of our Creator's righteousness. There are four very specific, very defined, divine dispensations in our Creator's plan. There are three defining borders for each of these dispensations. First, there's a change in the divinely appointed priesthood. Second, there's a corresponding change in divine laws and rituals. And thirdly, there is always a great outpouring of miraculous power validating the legitimacy of these changing dispensations that actually escalates in intensity with each transition. The first dispensation was the patriarchal age, when the patriarchs performed the duties of the priest, offering sacrifices, building altars, teaching their community about God, and directing the community in worship. <clears throat> Men like Adam, Abel, Noah, Shem, Job, Abraham, Isaac, Jacob are among those patriarchs performing those priestly duties. The second divine dispensation was the first kingdom age, when the priesthood dramatically changed and many new laws and rituals were introduced and there were powerful miraculous demonstrations of the Holy Spirit to confirm the validity of these changes and encourage compliance with the new standards within the enlightened community. The great ecclesial rebellion of brothers Korah, Dathan, and Abiram was the objection to this new highly limited priesthood change. The third dispensation is the current ecclesial age. We have a new, immortal, and eternal, never to be replaced, high priest. Brothers and sisters are directly and indirectly defined as priests in this dispensation with separate roles just like the priests and the Levites during the previous dispensation of the First Kingdom Age. The introduction into the Ecclesial Age certainly came with new laws and rituals, and there was an even greater outpouring of miraculous Holy Spirit power demonstrations to validate these changes. Paul even explains the Holy Spirit power that was invested into the Enlightened community for those first two generations, was for the express purpose of accommodating that paradigm shift to that new dispensation. Uh, Paul writes to the Ephesians in chapter 4, Wherefore, he says, when he ascended up on high, obviously referring to Jesus, he led, some, he led captivity captive and gave gifts unto men. Um, and then dropping down to verse 11, he gave some apostles and some prophets, some evangelists and some pastors and teachers. So these gifts were distributed to the enlightened for uh, a variety of occupational purposes in the support of the enlightened community. Verse 12, for, the, for why was this done? Why were these gifts given? For the perfecting, or properly understood maturing, of the saints, for the work of the ministry, for the edifying of the body. Of Christ, meaning the Ecclesia, till those gifts would end, till we all come in the unity of the faith and of the knowledge of the Son of God, unto a perfect or a mature man, unto the measure of the stature of the fullness of Christ. That, so for the purpose again, for these gifts, that we henceforth be no more children um, tossed <clears throat> excuse me, tossed to and fro, <laughs> left and right, and carried about with every wind of doctrine by the slight of men and cunning craftiness, whereby they lie in wait to deceive. So these gifts of the Holy Spirit were for the perfecting, meaning the maturing, of the saints, and to protect against the always present false teachers corrupting the enlightened community from the inside. And please closely note, that purpose for the Holy Spirit gifts is centered on the correct understanding of doctrine so that we might spiritually mature and not be immature little children in the knowledge of God, tossed left and right by those within our community who lie in wait to deceive. Again, this is an emphasis on the foundational significance of truth that is being so increasingly disrespected in this last generation of the Ecclesial Age. The first great apostasy of the Ecclesial Age 
was again the refusal of the enlightened community to mature beyond the previous dispensation, insisting even the Gentiles had to observe Sabbath law, to be circumcised, and not to eat unclean meats. The fourth dispensation in our Creator's plan will be the Millennial Kingdom Age. There will once again be both a new priesthood and once again two stages to that priesthood. There will be both immortal priests and mortal priests. This is when God will fulfill his promise to make the whole nation of Israel into a nation of priests. In the first kingdom age, the two stages were the priests and the Levites with their separate spiritual assignments. In the ecclesial priesthood age, there are brothers and sisters with their separate spiritual assignments. In the millennial kingdom, the, those two basic divisions will be the immortal priests and the mortal priests, once again with separate spiritual assignments assignments. There is no equality. Now, for our point in the context of our current consideration of a more subtle but still quite powerful prophecy validating the divinely unacceptable nature of this specific generation of the enlightened community, there are four transition generations identified with these four divine dispensations. Each of these transition generations, progressing out of one dispensation and into the next, is invariably defined in divinely unacceptable terms, without exception. The first transition generation of the enlightened community, uh, progressing from the patriarchal age into the first kingdom age, was so unacceptable to God that he condemned the entire generation of the men of war to die in the wilderness, with the two exceptions out of those more than 600,000 brethren in the truth, just Joshua and Caleb. In the next transition generation of the enlightened community, progressing from the first kingdom age into the ecclesial age, we see the destruction of Jerusalem, the destruction of the temple, destruction of the kingdom, and the execution of over one million members of the enlightened, covenant-bound community between the years 66 to 70 of the Common Era, with the enslavement of countless more. Just as the enlightened community had rejected the promised land after the spies' reports, so the enlightened, covenant-bound community, for the most part, rejected Jesus Christ, and some of those who actually did accept him often refused to accept the terms of the new dispensation, insisting everyone continue to operate under the terms of the first kingdom age, refusing to mature. Ours is the third transition generation that will progress from the conclusion of the ecclesial age uh, into the soon-to-be-anticipated restored kingdom age, the millennial kingdom age. We have a number of prophecies identifying specifically what is defined as the generation of the last days and the generation that will witness the return of Christ as being quite divinely unacceptable. But our individual hope is based in the fact that God always reserves a remnant and that we hope to be part of that remnant this pattern is exactly the same for the fourth transition generation of the enlightened community. Just, as, just after the conclusion of the millennial kingdom in the eighth millennium, the eighth divine day, we read that the sin influence will no longer be restrained. Revelation 20 describes this as uh, the Satan being loosed from his prison, that unchaining of the serpent, the dragon, Satan, Diabolos, from the bottom, bottomless pit. There is a subsequent rebellion, and the holy city is surrounded and besieged. So the question is, who are these rebels? Well, they're defined as Gog and Magog, but that doesn't mean these rebels are not part of the enlightened community. There have always been rebels within the enlightened community, always, no exception whatsoever. The same is very certainly true today, uh, just like every other generation. So 
How could there be anyone qualifying as being unenlightened after the entire planet has been ruled by Jesus Christ and the immortal saints for a thousand years? Are Christ and the saints going to be so ineffective and so lazy that there'll still be a huge portion of the global society that will be unfamiliar with the truth? That presumption seems to be highly disrespectful to Jesus Christ. This fourth transition generation of the enlightened community in the last generation of mortal life demonstrates exactly the same pattern of the previous three transition generations including our own. Now that's a rather humbling observation, as we are the third of those four very unique transition generations progressing from one divinely, uh, one divine dispensation into another. Instead of defensively objecting to this humbling understanding, which is which is a very common response in our community, this should be a wake-up call to a renewed and reinvigorated, reinvigorated conviction to correctly understand our Creator's righteousness, to correctly balance His principles and truths, and energetically promote that anti-instinctive divine righteousness in our words and deeds and thoughts, including defending the accelerating attacks on God's righteousness coming from within our generation of the enlightened community. Recognizing this understanding of the four divinely appointed dispensations in our Creator's plan can be helpful in a number of ways. Even though laws and rituals change, from one dispensation to another, the terms of our Creator's righteousness never change. They are eternal. Therefore, we should be encouraged to blend all these educational stages. There are different spiritual education themes to each dispensation, but they aren't improvements or permanent replacements these lessons all fit within the multitudinous singularity, that, that God manifestation principle, that necessary harmony our Creator insists upon, not unity among men, but harmony with God through Christ. So, in our previous class, we identified the burnt offering as the truth offering, and the peace offering as the love offering. Let's just make another observation about the peace offering in the context of how we recently considered uh, a spiritual education feature of the current virus pandemic. I think it was a couple of classes ago. Let's note how this peace offering, this love offering, where all three parties fellowship together with the same meal, could not be consumed or enjoyed by anyone that did not physically qualify as being divinely clean, that physical holiness distinction. And this is yet another confirmation of the divine truth that there is a physical component to divine acceptability, a physical holiness principle, which admittedly is not a focus of the current temporary laws, and rituals of the ecclesial age, but will be again in the restoration of God's kingdom on earth. So we read in Leviticus chapter 7, Moreover, the soul or the person that shall touch any unclean thing, as the uncleanness of man or any unclean beast or any abominable unclean thing, and eat of the flesh of the sacrifice of the peace offerings which pertain unto the Lord, even that soul, that person, shall be cut off from his people. This peace offering, the love offering, could not be eaten by anyone determined to be physically unclean by God's standards. There is a physical standard for holiness, just as there is a behavioral standard for holiness. 
This combination fits within the theme of earth and heaven that separate, saturates scripture. It is not one or the other. The correct understanding is the embracing of both earth and heaven, both physical and spiritual. As we noted in that class, the divine principle of the contagious nature of physical uncleanness being passed by touch is being silently shouted all over the world to everyone, enlightened and unenlightened, just before the restoration of the kingdom of God that will extend all over this world. So I would recommend that as we do our daily readings, so that we don't turn aside to the, to the left or the right from the terms of God's righteousness, that we should be listening for that divine emphasis on the principle uh, of physical holiness, despite not being emphasized in the temporary laws and rituals of the ecclesial age, this is an eternal principle that has to blend perfectly with all other divine truths and principles in order to achieve that multitudinous singularity, distinguishing the principle of God manifestation. We do not have the current responsibility to pursue or observe physical holiness rituals, but we still need to understand and respect that feature of what our Creator testifies to be right. We've determined that we need both truth and love for divine acceptability, but also that truth is greater than love, and that love has to be built on the foundation of truth, and that love does not cancel out that foundational necessity for truth. We've also seen how to properly balance the layered significance of the love commandments presented by God in Christ. Now let's consider another related issue that deals with blending and balancing divine principles that appear to contradict if we only offer a casual consideration, or even going so far as dismissing one of them as unnecessary. As we've noted, it's not always easy to understand the rightness of God's judgments, alike like comparing the stoning execution of the man picking up firewood on a Sabbath, compared to Jesus defending his disciples when they picked and ate grain on a Sabbath. We should understand the, the principle of spiritual balance and what issues take precedence over others. So let's consider the balance of faith and works. There are basically two righteousness categories. There is imputed righteousness and personal righteousness. Imputed righteousness is based on faith. Personal righteousness is based on the works and deeds uh, individually performed that will constitute the basis of our judgment, reviewing how we did or did not demonstrate God's righteousness and our own personal words and deeds after we came to a correct understanding about the terms of God's righteousness, what, what we call the truth. So, we need both imputed righteousness and personal righteousness for salvation, <laughs> not just one or the other. Professed faith without works of faith cannot save us, but works alone cannot earn salvation either at least outside of Jesus Christ, who did earn salvation. We need both uh, faith and works. But how must we understand the balance between these two required components to afford that divine acceptability that results in salvation? A powerful validation of the correct balance of faith and works is to consider how God demonstrated this balance in the signature rituals of the two great covenants of faith and works. Paul addressed the issues of faith and works frequently in his letters to the enlightened community during his ministry, and this is because of the default presumption 
of the enlightened community prior to the death and resurrection of Jesus being that divine acceptability was based exclusively on works that personally demonstrated righteousness of God in our works and deeds. Therefore, there's a very frequent and powerful emphasis in the divinely inspired writings of the Apostle Paul addressing the issue of faith and how faith compensates for our shortfalls when it comes to our imperfect performance of the righteousness of God in our words and our works. One particular focus in this context was the Jewish presumption of the absolute significance of the circumcision ritual. Circumcision was certainly the signature ritual of the Abrahamic covenant of faith. We read this, uh, God makes this very clear in Genesis 17, um, began with verse 10. God says, this is my covenant, which you shall keep between me and you and your seed after you. Every man child among you shall be circumcised and you shall circumcise the flesh of your foreskin, and it shall be a token of the covenant betwixt me and you. And he that is eight days old shall be circumcised among every man-child in your generations. He that is born in the house or bought with money of any stranger, which is not of your seed, and the circumcised man-child whose flesh of his foreskin, foreskin is not circumcised, that soul shall be cut off from his people. He has broken my covenant. God declares circumcision to be the token of the covenant between Abraham and Abraham's seed, both that singular seed of Jesus Christ and the seed or descendants of Abraham, of which we qualify on the basis of faith as opposed to genealogy. The Hebrew word translated as token here is oth, and it is O-T-H, and it is also translated as sign. Circumcision was the appointed sign, the token of the Abrahamic covenant of faith, that physical representation of that covenant. This is the same designation given to the rainbow, which was the physical sign of God's covenant with Noah never to again destroy all flesh with water. We read this in uh, Genesis 9. We read, then God said, This is the token oath of the covenant which I make between me and you and every living creature that's with you for perpetual generations. I do set my bow in the cloud, and it shall be for a token of a covenant between me and the earth. And it shall come to pass, when I bring a cloud over the earth, that the bow shall be seen in the cloud. And I will remember my covenant, which is between me and you, and every living creature of all flesh. And the waters shall no more become a flood to destroy all flesh. And the bow shall be in the cloud, and I will look upon it, that I may remember the everlasting covenant between God and every living creature of all flesh that is upon the earth. And God said unto Noah, this is the token, oath, sign of the covenant, which I have established between me and all flesh that is upon the earth. The rainbow was the token, the oath, the appointed sign for the covenant with Noah, in the same sense that circumcision served as the token, the sign, the physical validation of the covenant with Abraham, that faith covenant. The same Hebrew word, uh, O-T-H, is used to identify the signature ritual of the covenant of works made through Moses. We read in Exodus chapter 31, The Lord spake unto Moses, saying, Speak thou also unto the children of Israel, Verily my Sabbaths you shall keep, for it is a sign, oath, token, between me and you throughout your generations, that you may know that I am the Lord that does sanctify you. You shall keep the Sabbath, therefore, for it is holy unto you. Everyone that defiles it shall surely be put to death. For whosoever does any work therein, that soul shall be cut off from among his people. Wherefore the children of Israel shall keep the Sabbath to observe the Sabbath throughout their generations for a perpetual 
covenant. It is a sign, oath, token, between me and the children of Israel forever. For in six days the Lord made heaven and earth, and on the seventh day he rested and was refreshed. So God defines Sabbath law as the sign, the oath, the token of the covenant, and identifies it with that seventh and last day of the creation week. However, that identification with the creation week was not the exclusive reason God offered for instituting this signature ritual of the Mosaic Covenant. In Deuteronomy 5, we hear Moses recounting the Ten Commandments, and when he comes to the Fourth Commandment, observing the Sabbath, we hear why that covenant ritual, signature ritual, was imposed. So Deuteronomy 5, uh, starting at verse 15, And remember that you were a servant in the land of Egypt, and that the Lord thy God brought thee out thence through a mighty hand and by a stretched out arm. Therefore the Lord thy God commanded thee to keep the Sabbath day. This explanation distances the Sabbath ritual from the presumption that it was observed from creation week, and it stood, should still be observed today, as is promoted by some of the paganized Christian religions. It should also be understood there were two separate Sabbath qualifications. One was certainly Saturday, that seventh day of the week. However, there were also high Sabbaths that were on specific days of specific months, and most frequently those Sabbaths were not observed on a Saturday. The day immediately following every Passover was always a high Sabbath, the 15th day of the first month of the sun. This kind of Sabbath noted in, is noted in John 19 that followed the death of Jesus late on that necessarily Wednesday afternoon on the Passover on the 14th day of Nisan in the year 30 of the Common Era. John 19 tells us it was discovered that Jesus had already died when the Roman soldiers came to break the legs of the crucified and take them down from their crosses. We read that was that, that was requested because the of the approaching day was a high day, indicating the high Sabbath qualification of the first day of the Feast of Unleavened Bread immediately following Passover. In fact, there, both of those categories of the Sabbaths uh, took place during those three days Jesus was dead in the tomb. The first day, Thursday, was a high Sabbath, and the third day was a Saturday, or a seventh-day Sabbath. There, there's, there's a lot more to the Sabbath ritual than simply being a ritual projection of the seventh day of the creation week, that day of divine rest. This sign or token status of the Sabbath ritual is confirmed in Ezekiel as well. In Ezekiel chapter 20, uh, we read in a couple of verses, Moreover, also I gave them my Sabbaths to be a sign, token, oath, between me and them, that they might know that I am the Lord that sanctify them, and hallow my Sabbaths, and they shall be a sign, token, oath, between me and you, that you may know that I am the Lord your God. And that, that word sign there, is, as I indicated, is from the same Hebrew word, O-T-H, again confirming Sabbath observance to be the signature ritual of the Mosaic Covenant of Works. Just as the rainbow was appointed to be the sign, the physical representation of the covenant with Noah and all animals of the earth, all flesh, and circumcision was assigned to be the token, the sign, the physical representation of the covenant with Abraham, and his seed, that faith covenant. Now, it is certainly recognized that neither circumcision nor Sabbath observance are required to be observed during our current divinely appointed dispensation, our ecclesial age. The Apostle Paul makes this issue very clear in relation to both circumcision and Sabbath observance. The circumcision that is required of the faithful in this dispensation is the circumcision of the heart, faithfully cutting away that self-exalting crown of flesh 
frame of reference that we're all born with, uh, that serpent mentality. This is a spiritual circumcision, extending from that same theme of faith in the covenant with Abraham, for which circumcision served as the signature ritual. But we have reviewed over and over and over again the spiritual aspect alone is incomplete all by itself. We need both physical and spiritual. We need both earth and heaven for the full understanding of any issue. Therefore, it should not be surprising to understand that both of these rituals, circumcision and Sabbath observance, will again be required to be observed in the soon-to-be-restored kingdom of God. Ezekiel makes this perfectly clear in the details given to him by God for that fourth divine sanctuary that Jesus will construct and the dual priesthood design of the millennial kingdom age of both mortal and immortal priests and, of course, the many rituals that will be required to be observed, including Passover, the Feast of Tabernacles, animal sacrifices, and circumcision and Sabbath observance. We already noted the in previous uh, presentations, the additional seven burnt offerings the prince will offer on each Sabbath for a total of eight. Circumcision will also be required. We read in the, within the prophecy that Ezekiel is given, beginning in chapter 40 through 48, uh, with that incredible time stamp of uh, 50 years to the day, a jubilee to the day of the great national repentance in Josiah's Passover, I believe it was the 18th year of his reign, um, on that uh, as the prophecy begins on the 10th day of the first month, the, the uh, very day that the Passover lamb was chosen. Um, so that, and then of course we have the third uh, vision, uh, uh, Ezekiel's third um, vision of the cherubim within that time frame too. And we have the description of that, that uh, temple that Christ the prince will be assigned to build, construct. Within that, prophecy, we have this um, statement by God concerning the law of circumcision in Ezekiel 44. Thus says Adonai Yahweh, no stranger, uncircumcised in heart nor uncircumcised in flesh, shall enter into my sanctuary of any stranger that is among the children of Israel. So absolutely no one wishing to enter that fourth divine sanctuary, that temple, Jesus will construct in Jerusalem, uh, will be allowed to enter if they are not both circumcised in uh, physically and spiritually. Not one or the other, both. That physical circumcision application uh, was demanded beginning in the patriarchal age, continued through the first kingdom age, but not into the ecclesial age where the spiritual circumcision application was emphasized that circumcision of the heart. But in the millennial kingdom, both the physical and the spiritual circumcision applications will be required. Again, both earth and heaven, both physical and spiritual, a blending, and not one or the other, not left or right, but exactly all that God requires. So, both Sabbath observance and circumcision will be restored along with the restoration of the kingdom of God under the political and spiritual leadership of the Son of God. These are the two signature rituals of the Abrahamic covenant of faith and the Mosaic covenant of works. Just like truth and love, we are not allowed to eliminate one to the exclusive value of the other. Just like love and truth, we need to understand the right divinely ordained balance between these two principles. Now, the way we can balance the requirement of both faith and works is to consider these two signature rituals God assigned to each covenant, which would be observed at the expense of the other. Each signature ritual had a timing requirement. Circumcision had to be performed on the eighth day of a boy's life, 
Sabbath observance demanded a rest from labors primarily on the seventh day of each week. But what was supposed to happen when that eighth day for the circumcision requirement fell on a Saturday? One's not supposed to do any work on a Sabbath. So should the circumcision ritual be performed a day earlier or later? I mean, after all, it was a death sentence for disrespecting Sabbath law. What is really interesting is that God does not give anyone an easy answer to this question of which is greater, circumcision or Sabbath observance, and therefore faith or works. Well, our our time has uh, been fulfilled. Uh, We're going to have to close at this point at that that, uh, tune-in next week, as they say. Um, uh, when we'll examine this issue and how these two signature rituals uh, interact and which God demonstrates is greater than the other and Jesus confirms. So um, we will look at that subject of which was greater next week and how that impacts our discipleship. And uh, hopefully everybody can join us next week to consider that continuing subject of the balance between faith and works.